Hello, I'm Nancy Helmester Brooks, and I'm going to speak to you in this on demand webinar on the clinical utility of the cognitive linguistic quick test, of which I am the author. You can see from my uh, first slide that I am a distinguished professor emerita at the University of, uh, well, Western Carolina University, and uh, I'm in the Department of Communication Sciences and Disorders, and we're located in the beautiful Blue Ridge Mountains. Uh, I've tried to give you a sense of those in this little uh, picture that I've included. Okay, um, I've included my picture, my picture also, uh, so you'll have uh, an idea of who's speaking with you. Um, and I've given you a little outline of the webinar um, and we'll uh, take it from this outline and present on the following subtopics. Uh, first, I'm going to do a little overview of the CLQT and um, then we'll get into some diagnostic uses of the Clicket with various neurological populations. And the ones I'm going to speak of today are Parkinson's disease, traumatic brain injury, aphasia, usually associated with the left hemisphere stroke, um, use of the CLQT with HIV AIDS and um, with um, myocognitive impairment, which is a, a growing uh, topic of interest in our fields. Uh, next, I'll speak about uh, the use of the CLQT uh, in identifying um, and documenting uh, the presence of visual neglect, which is most common in right CVAs or right hemisphere strokes. And I have a case in point to illustrate that. Uh, then we'll move into using the CLQT and um, determining driving competency, uh, driving a car that is, not, not driving in golf, although it may have something to do with that, but nobody studied it. Okay, and finally I'll talk about the uh, CLQT um, subtest of clock drawing and the whole idea of using clock drawing as a cognitive mini screen, and I have some uh, studies that, that show um, that clock drawing can be used as a cognitive mini screen. Okay, for our overview of the cognitive linguistic quick test. Well, um, it is a, a, a way to quickly measure cognitive strengths and weaknesses in the five primary uh, cognitive domains. And those are the domains of attention, memory, executive functions, language, and visual spatial skills. Uh, the test is appropriate for adults uh, 18 to 89 years old with known or suspected neurological impairment. And you can administer this test uh, in 15 to 30 minutes. It's never taken me 30 minutes because a lot of the subtests are timed. And uh, so uh, only a certain amount of time is allotted for them. And that uh, usually reduces the time for me to 20 to 25 minutes. Um, it can be scored in 10 to 15 minutes. So all in all, uh, this from start to finish uh, may take you about a half hour and you'll have your, your documented results. Uh, you can administer the click it at either uh, a, a table uh, across from your patient or uh, even at bedside, um, particularly if you have a clipboard. And um, the CLQT is available because from the get-go, we did uh, and developed this test for English and Spanish-speaking individuals. Okay, so here are our five cognitive domains, 
and um, around the periphery of this illustration. And those all uh, will contribute to a total composite severity rating. So we'll get severity ratings in executive function, visual spatial skills, language, attention, and memory. And uh, in a summary, uh, we can get a total composite score for uh, overall cognition. I, the uh, clicket is comprised of 10 uh, subtests or um, mini tests. And what we've done in uh, and what I did from the get-go is list the uh, five cognitive domains uh, and you can see them across the top of this figure or table and the attention memory executive functions language visual spatial skills and then um, I chose the 10 subtests to together uh, assess uh, all of these uh, cognitive domains, uh, but not all tests sub, uh, look at it if every cognitive domain. So we have personal facts, and when you ask the person uh, four questions about themselves, uh, some of them going back uh, in their lives, uh, it's going to test mainly memory and language because you have to process the questions and respond. Something like symbol cancellation, and we'll see some examples later of uh, these subtests, um, looks at uh, attention and visual spatial skills, but you really don't need any memory for it. Your instructions are clear uh, and are, are nothing that you have to put into even short-term memory. And uh, it doesn't take any executive functions or language skills. And so on, down the line, uh, just thinking, I'll do one more. Confrontation naming, you're shown a picture. The pictures are very clear. The pictures were vetted by uh, many um, people who could identify the pictures. Uh, upon first presentation, in fact, we redrew many, so we could get that instant uh, recognition. And you know, looking at a picture and and saying what it is uh, really is only a language test. So you'll see, looking down, clock drawing is the only thing that um, really hits every cognitive domain, and we'll get into clock drawing more later uh, in this webinar. Okay, um, just quickly, we did um, a pilot study with uh, 13 non-clinical. That means the average person without medical problems. Uh, we uh, looked at non-clinical examinees, 28 to 75. Uh, we did some revising of the items and then we did our first study, which was 64 non-clinical individuals. Um, and we looked at 28 people with uh, various clinical conditions. And there we went 18 to 89. Um, and we uh, matched the age, race, or ethnicity, and the education uh, of the clinical and non-clinical examinees. And we had 30 examiners in 18 states to, of the United States to uh, sample uh, a wide variety of geographic areas. Uh, at study two, uh, we had 154 non-clinical uh, examinees. Again, the same age range. Uh, it, uh, the sample included white uh, African American and Hispanic people who were now primarily speaking uh, language, um, uh, English as a language, um, and 61 examiners in this time 21 states. Okay, the third study, 119 non-clinical examinees and 38 uh, neurologic um, uh, 
individuals or people with neurologic conditions. And 81 uh, of the non-clinical and clinicals were matched uh, by sex, age, education level, and ethnicity. And so uh, that time we had 16 states, 30 examiners, and you'll see speech language pathologists, occupational therapists, RN, psychologists, neuropsychologists, therapeutic recreation specialists. And at that point, we did validity and right reliability studies. And here's our clinical sample, or 38 of our clinical sample. Uh, we had um, 38, wait a minute, 38 people in, in all, and they were divided between right CVA, left CVA, bilateral CVAs, closed head injury, and that's in the first column. Uh, these should be uh, reordered, I guess, and Alzheimer's disease. Oh, I know why those weren't reordered, because they're by age groups, and your largest age group um, is uh, your, your young, for the young age group is closed head injury, as most of you will know, and your Alzheimer's group cluster uh, in the uh, 70 to 79 and 80 to 89 ranges. Okay, for the Spanish version, uh, we standardize the vocabulary and instructions which are in Spanish. And we have uh, proficient speakers uh, as examiners who are familiar with Spanish spoken as, as spoken in uh, several places, as you can read on this slide. Um, study two, we had 31 non-clinical Spanish speakers from five states. And um, they uh, matched in range to our uh, English, uh, primarily English speaking uh, group, 18 to 89. And you can see the breakdown uh, pretty uh, even 15 males, 16 females. And education below 12 years to uh, more than 16 years. Um, so um, we did find significant differences in memory and the language domains uh, for the Spanish um, speaking group as opposed to the English speakers. Uh, so there are modified severity scores uh, for these two domains in the Spanish version. OK, um, again. All our participants in our studies represented different ages, socioeconomic, culture, and education backgrounds. Uh, we set up criteria and cut scores uh, so the, that you'll get scores that are, as you administer it, uh, within normal limits, uh, mild impairment, moderate impairment, and severe impairment. And for, for each of the cognitive domains and for two age groups, and 18 to 69 and 70 to 89. And that's because even though we sampled um, from uh, de decade by decade, we were unable to find significant differences until age 70. And that was only on some of the subtests. So now we have the, only the two age groups. Um, and then, as I said, you get total composite severity ratings, but you get them for both age groups and uh, severity ratings for each of the five cognitive domains. And I should point out that a separate severity rating is obtained for clock drawing for both age groups. And uh, the and I've got in bold face and italics here, that you can use the clock drawing as uh, a quick monitor of both progress, say, uh, with the healing process, natural healing process, or with therapy, or even uh, with decline, as we might see in Alzheimer's disease. Okay, 
let's look at some diagnostic uses of the uh, clicket. Uh, first, a couple of studies done with Parkinson's disease. Um, uh, this uh, first study was done by Parashows and colleagues uh, who are neurologists mostly. And uh, they had 93 Parkinson's cases. Uh, you see 48 men, 45 women. And they evaluated them with the CLQT and the uh, mini mental status exam. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. It's used widely by uh, a variety of professions, including uh, MDs are likely to use this exam. And uh, I like to point out, particularly if you're working with people with language disorders, with aphasia, this is a, not a good test for them because uh, virtually all the question uh, or all the items require uh, processing or production of language, except for that. Uh, design copy that's down there. Uh, so uh, people with language problems are going to look as though they might have uh, serious uh, cognitive issues, uh, even dementia, when indeed it's just their aphasia. Okay, um, what they found was um, in correlating the clicket scores to the MMSE uh, that uh, the clicket scores correlated well with the MMSC, um, and the diagnostic values for the presence of dementia in Parkinson's disease was similar for the two tests. But I've quoted them as saying, unlike the MMSC, the CLQD also provided domain specific information on cognitive uh, deficits, where you just get this overall. Uh, score from the MMSC doesn't really tell you a whole lot except that there are problems present. And they conclude that the clicket is a valuable instrument in assessing cognitive dysfunction in Parkinson's disease and that it's superior to the mini mental as it also provides cognitive domain specific information. Uh, the Parashows also uh, did uh, another study that he presented at the American Academy of Neurology uh, with uh, 24 individuals with Parkinson's disease. And this time he administered uh, multiple standard batteries, uh, psychometric instrument battery that targeted various cognitive skills. And I've listed these. Uh, psychometric test or uh, neuropsychological test that he uh, administered to uh, his subjects and our participants, we're supposed to say now. Uh, and he found that overall the uh, clicket domain scores correlated well with neuropsychometric measures of corresponding cognitive functions. So they conclude, or he concludes, that the LQT is an effective screening of cognitive functions in patients with Parkinson's disease. And of course, uh, the study I just spoke of also confirms that. And uh, the uh, clicket provides more information than other short test batteries, like the mini mental, and is uh, less expensive, and I must say, less far less time consuming than formal neuropsychological testing. Okay, how about traumatic brain injury? Well, um, this is a study uh, that was carried out in Australia by um, uh, both uh, speech pathologists and occupational therapists. And in this study, they uh, looked at the clinical utility of the Cognostat uh, versus the clicket in assessing cognitive communicative uh, disorders. Um, and I'm just going to, I'll come back to that. But if, if you're not familiar with the Cognostat, although I understand that it's pretty widely used, with, particularly by occupational therapists, uh, it, uh, it's a test that can be administered in usually less than 45 minutes. I take this off their website. 
and it explores, quantifies, describes performance in uh, central areas, I think, I think that was several areas, but maybe central, of brain behavior relations. And you can see uh, the uh, list of them here, and you will be able to see this on your handout, but you can go to their site to find out more about the Cognistat if you don't know about it already. So going back, they looked at the clinical utility of the Cognistat versus the Clicket. Uh, in 83 individuals with post-TBI uh, who were in an acute trauma center. And the Clicket they found was superior to the Cognistat in identifying high-level cognitive communicative deficits. And they said no variables relating to patients' brain injury or recovery patterns predicted the language impairment, uh, but that the uh, clicker was able to pick those up. And they have a case in point. Uh, they describe a 20-year-old male working full-time as a builder. He had a motor vehicle accident. Uh, his uh, Glasgow coma scale was 13 at the scene. His CT scan was more normal. Um, he had no neurosurgical treatment, um, and he was not considered to have post-traumatic amnesia uh, by the docs. Um, but they assessed him uh, 10 days post-injury. And on the left, you'll see the CLQT results showing attention, normal limits, executive function, visual spatial skills within normal limits, but memory impairment was moderate and language impairment was mild. Uh, and let's contrast that with uh, the Cognistat. Same findings on attention, executive functions, and visual spatial skills, but uh, the Cognistat also said memory and language were within normal limits. So the click it seems to have picked up uh, two problems and uh, which can be serious problems for uh, resuming uh, work and everyday life uh, that the Cognistat did not pick up, that is memory and, and language problems. Okay, how about in aphasia? This is a study I did, and by the way, we now have uh, a version of the CLQT that's been uh, in the last stages of development uh, and hopefully will be published not too long from now on 76 people with left hemisphere strokes and aphasia. But here we go back to uh, 2002 where um, I was looking at cognition and aphasia. And I have five females and eight males. And you can see quite an ed, uh, age range, an education range, and uh, a very large um, time post onset range from two to 118 months. All uh, these participants were right-handed before this stroke. And 11 out of 13, had right hemiplegia, which forced them to use their non-preferred left hands for the uh, graphomotor task. And, and it, you know, you, you can make allowances. Uh, I always suggest a clinician try these tasks with uh, uh, her or his uh, left hand and, and see uh, what kind of results um, that he or she gets and uh, compare that with what uh, your hemiplegic patient using their non-preferred hand would uh, do as far as the graphomotor aspects of uh, completing the click of task. Okay, so I uh, looked at four uh, click of linguistic tasks, personal facts, confrontation naming, story retelling and comprehension, and generative naming. Uh, you could get a total score of 37 points if you um, aced everything, and um, then uh, four non-linguistic tasks, and I um, those uh, you could earn a score of 36 points. There's symbol 
cancellation, symbol designs, memory for designs, and mazes, and none of those require language uh, comprehension or production. Well, what I found was a great range on both the linguistic and non-linguistic tasks. Uh, you can see zero points out of 37 is very severe aphasia, uh, very severe language problems um, to a milder form of, uh, with a uh, score of 26. Uh, the non-linguistic range was 11 to uh, 34, looking at 36 possible points. So uh, there were people uh, who, or at least one person, who did extremely well as long as language was not involved. Um, so what I found was the correlation between the two composite scores was not significant. So uh, we can then say that performance on task involving attention, executive functions, memory, and visual spatial processes could not be predicted on the basis of linguistic task performance or, in this case, aphasia severity. Um, and I also found that the correlations were not significant between non-linguistic performance and time post-onset, their age or their education. Instead, individual profiles of strengths and weaknesses prevailed. So my take-home message from the studies, you cannot predict the integrity of non-linguistic cognitive skills on the basis of aphasia severity, and therefore, you must assess these skills as we know that non-linguistic cognitive skills are highly important to response to treatment, both uh, in the ongoing treatment uh, protocol and carry over uh, to uh, functional use of those skills. And there are many uh, since uh, my study in 2002 that have looked at cognition and aphasia and um, non-linguistic cognitive skills in response to therapy um, and pretty much uh, agree with uh, the study that, that uh, was done um, now, 14 years ago. Okay, uh, using the clicker with HIV and AIDS, there's I found one study, um, and this one was in South Africa, and Mupo Wazi, I hope I'm saying it right, and Broom, uh, used the CLQT to assess cognition in 16 South African individuals with HIV or AIDS. And uh, using the uh, Clicket, 87.5% of individuals uh, were diagnosed with some form of cognitive deficit. And so um, they conclude, uh, like Pam shows, that um, you can use the clicket with a population, and in this case HIV, as a substitute for more expensive and time-consuming neuropsych uh, protocols uh, or, you know, large batteries. Okay, mild cognitive impairment. This is a study uh, by my uh, colleague Colleen Caro, that's uh, and uh, her colleague uh, Charlotte Bloom, that's now uh, in preparation. Um, they looked at the value of the clicked um, and compared it to four other neuropsych assessments in diagnosing mild cognitive impairment in uh, community dwelling individuals. So they have 58 individuals. Uh, you can see that because they're elders, they were 70 to 93. Uh, and I know that goes uh, slightly out of the range at 93 for uh, the CLQT, but others are finding that um, ranging a little bit out of that 89 is okay for the use of the clicket. Okay, um, they, uh, these individuals were volunteers for an eight-week cognitive wellness program. And uh, they compared the clicket to the mini mental state exam 
to the California Verbal Learning Test, which is a uh, highly uh, used um, way to look at uh, particularly auditory memory. It does require um, not only memorizing uh, lists, but uh, repeating them back. So it uh, has a lot of language involvement. We don't use it with people with aphasia, but highly used with other um, populations. The uh, quick test of cognitive speed for dementia was uh, the third uh, measure. And uh, rapid assessment of problem solving. If you're not familiar with those, you can look them up on the internet. Okay, so what did they find? They found that 12 individuals, or 26%, who were supposed to be uh, without particular cognitive problems, just elderly dwelling in the community, uh, not in nursing homes, not in retirement homes, but 26 demonstrated scores consisted with atypical, and that's 26%, cognitive aging or mild cognitive impairment. Uh, they found that the uh, mini mental correlated with the click of language domain. I see that language uh, effect in the mini mental, the, so I don't want to use with uh, people with aphasia. And it mo moderately correlated with the um, um, uh, the MMSC with a click and memory domain. And all click and domains correlated uh, highly with a delayed recall trial of the uh, California Verbal Learning Test. And so it's important if you don't know that test to take a look at it. And the AQT um, color form subtest was highly correlated with the click at attention, language, and visual spatial domains, and moderately correlated with click at memory rating. Uh, so they conclude each test uh, used had significant diagnostic diagnostic implications, but the CLQT has the advantage it provided a valid cognitive composite scores as well as objective measures of specific performance across five, uh, five primary domains of cognition. Okay, now let's turn to the um, topic of visual neglect and, and use our case to illustrate it. Um, just in review, I'm sure that uh, you experienced clinicians are familiar with the syndrome of neglect, but it's failure to report, to respond to or orient to stimulation in the contralateral, extrapersonal, or interpersonal environment. And that's contralateral to the site of lesion. So if you have right hemisphere lesion, the uh, neglect would be uh, to the left side. And it's not due to elementary sensory or motor impairment. And in its complete form, uh, neglect manifests as a remarkable unawareness of the contralateral hemispace or body, which makes them a particular uh, therapeutic uh, challenge to people, uh, to OTs and PTs who are working with uh, this uh, diagnostic population. And I just put this little illustration there on the right of some drawings by a person with left neglect. Okay, it can be so pervasive that even in the absence of neurological functioning or neurological deficits, it's precludes functional competency. So um, it, it, neglect can be a very serious problem for uh, return to independent living. Um, they're uh, effectively cut off from one side of their external and personal wor worlds. And um, as I said, uh, those with uh, lasting neglect, less likely to live independently than even people with aphasia and right hemiparesis. So even though their language may be uh, intact, uh, they have uh, difficulty living independently. 
Um, and here's a case in point, a 71-year-old right-handed woman. She had 10 years of education and a history of heart disease. By the way, this is from the uh, CLQT manual. Um, it, uh, the CLICA was administered three months after a right hemisphere stroke and she had severe left hemiplegia. So the profile for the CLICA is sort of typical of somebody with the right CVA, right-handed person with the right CVA, language within normal limits, uh, mild impairment in memory, moderate impairment in attention, moderate impairment in executive function and visual spatial skills. So uh, no aphasia. All right, and here is her performance uh, on uh, the symbol cancellation subtest. And um, the red circles show her omission, and you can see that she just doesn't pay any attention to the left-hand side of the uh, stimulus page. Um, the, and then uh, we can see that uh, the targets are in green and those are the ones she's supposed to be crossing out and she crosses out three targets way over on the right and then she has uh, in bl um, blue I have I think that's supposed to be black. It's not very blue, is it? Uh, errors of commission, which is um, that that she crossed out the wrong targets. Okay, um, and, and in fact, wait a minute, she even left that one out uh, way down in the corner of the right hand. She seems to be indicating it, but she's off to the right of that. Um, uh, stimulus design uh, in putting in a cross. Okay, and this is her uh, symbol trails. She's supposed to be going from the smallest circle to the smallest tri uh, smallest circle to the smallest triangle to the next biggest circle to the next biggest triangle and so uh, there are two um, uh, components to this subtest in which you train somebody to do by shape and by size. So this is the final one that scored and you can see that she uh, doesn't get very far because she, although she gets smallest circle, smallest triangle, she uh, fails to go off then to uh, the left hand side to get her next biggest circle and, uh, and sort of aborts the task. And uh, again, her visual neglect is shown on this uh, maze, the uh, second of the two mazes on the clicket, and it's the harder one. Um, and again, you can't get to it uh, without breaking the rules and not pay attention to the left-hand side. Okay, so um, let's look at her scale of functional performance that the, that the psychologist uh, at the facility uh, rated her uh, as having. Uh, she uh, had very poor attention to environmental items in the left side of space. She neglected the left side of her body. She uh, paid little attention to her personal appearance. Sort of have to look at both sides of your body to uh, have good personal appearance, uh, grooming and so forth. And she had moderate difficulty in uh, her awareness of her own problems and keeping track of her possessions and finding her way around and remember, remembering new directions, using the telephone, remembering to take medications, and planning, organizing, and executing multi-step daily activities. And those certainly go uh, with her. Uh, with her click of performance uh, was able to predict these problems, if you will. Okay, let's look at the CLQT as an off-road driving assessment. I'm aware that uh, more and more uh, occupational therapists uh, and uh, physical therapists particularly, and uh, some uh, speech pathologists 
uh, less or so, are getting involved in assessing people for their ability to drive or to continue driving. Um, I just put this little uh, reminder up here that driving has symbolic functions that far surpass the utilitarian uh, value of the act itself. And we know how important uh, maintaining your license and being able to continue to drive is to uh, all adults who are in fact drivers. Uh, and we just have to consider uh, all that is required to drive uh, and to re and is required to maintain your independence through driving. Uh, it's a very complex task. It requires uh, a range of cognitive, psychomotor, and other functional skills. You have to perceive and attend to stimuli uh, through your sensory inputs and interpret the situation on the road. You have to formulate plans uh, based on your particular driving situation. Uh, where are you going? How are you going to get there? Uh, and on uh, relevant previous experiences or memories. Um, and you have to execute actions like applying the accelerator, the brake, the steering controls, etc. And you have to constantly monitor the outcome of your behaviors. And you have to have feedback for corrective actions and to make your decisions about uh, speed, direction, etc. And this is why nobody should be talking on their cell phone. Uh, it, uh, particularly if it involves holding the cell phone, but even with those hands free. And uh, certainly never texting. Uh, and we know that uh, much of the increase of accidents is due to those two uh, activities, texting and talking in your car. Okay, um, older drivers, 70 and older, they're, um, and that's our uh, as you will recall, our uh, age beginning for our uh, second group of CLQT um, uh, examinees, um, they make up 13% of the current driving population. They're the fastest growing segment of drivers. Um, the, here's a statistic for you, 33 million U.S. drivers ex expected to be age uh, 65 and older by the year uh, 20, and that's not far off, is it? Okay, older drivers have a higher crash rate uh, per driving mile than any other age group, adult age group. So we're not talking about 16-year-olds here, I don't think. Okay, and look at this uh, very um, dramatic illustration of uh, what and what happens accident wise and uh, what happens with crashes so you see that uh, the 16 year olds in fact have the highest rate and then as you uh, near your adulthood they go down uh, uh, you can see why the cutoff for insurance is all, uh, for insurance rates going up or down is often 25 years and then uh, things sort of level out and until uh, age 70 or so and they begin climbing back up okay um, why does this occur with the older people? Well, you have age-related, disease-related changes in physical, motor, sensory, and cognitive functions, and those can impair driving ability and account for some of the increases in motor vehicle uh, crash rates uh, per mile uh, that is driven. Um, and your role as uh, someone who's going to assess uh, the the uh, ability to continue maintaining the license uh, or even uh, reclaiming your license uh, in older individuals. 
you're going to have to conduct functional medical assessments. Well, not the medical assessment, but somebody's going to have to do that, the MD. And, um, and this may help determine overall driving safety. And uh, you have to communicate your recommendations effectively to their older drivers and their family members, because the older drivers are not going to like this recommendation uh, if it is that they should not continue to drive. So you have to be very careful how you present that. Okay, um, safe driving, uh, dementia, safe driving, uh, using the click it. Uh, I have a case from uh, that was given to me quite a while ago, but um, still relevant by Lynn Hendricks. She is a speech pathologist uh, at, in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, who uh, does uh, assessment of uh, ability to drive, uh, including in neurological population. So that may be after TBI in a younger person or in the older person with cognitive changes. So she gave me the example of a 74-year-old male and his wife reported he drives past the gate to the community. She has to tell him where to turn when they're out and about. She's co-piloting his driving. That's a quote from her. Uh, he's carrying three wallets because he can't remember his address or phone number. He can't find his medication list in his wallet or even remember it's there. Um, but, and so she's very concerned even though he has not had a driving accident or ticket yet. And part of that may be because she's right beside him co-piloting. Um, these were his CLQT results, and you can see uh, over on the right-hand side uh, the severity rating table for 70 to 89. Uh, his attention uh, severity rating is uh, his mild impairment, his memory and executive function ratings are in the uh, severe uh, area of uh, severe impairment. Um, his language and his visual spatial skills are moderately impaired. And so given the CLQT, we're not surprised at the problems his wife is reporting. And this is a case that he, uh, uh, with high probability, should not be driving. Okay, finally, the CLQT clock is a cognitive mini screen. I put this little funny clock or humorous clock up here, whatever, but turns out that clock drawing is very important and we shouldn't just say whatever. Okay, the um, Critchley in 1953 was probably the first to mention clock drawing as a clinical assessment tool. Critchley was a neurologist in, in England. Uh, so in the, in the more than 60 years since, uh, Clock drawing is often used to assess mental status of individuals with known or suspected uh, neurological or psychiatric disorders. And in fact, in the um, Medicare wellness uh, exam in which people 65 or over uh, have uh, a review of their uh, health status um, as just a part of keeping them healthy. They discuss drugs and shots and all that. But um, the clock drawing is one of the assessment tools that most people, uh, most docs or uh, even um, pharmacists sometimes do the wellness exam because they're reviewing uh, medications. Uh, they use the clock drawing as an assessment of mental status. Um, so, um, Argrel and Delage um, reviewed uh, lots of studies on clock drawing and they conclude that it is a good screening test for dementia and cognitive uh, dysfunction with the possible exception of cases of very early Alzheimer's disease. It high correlates, this is according to a review of studies with the mini mental uh, and other tests of cognitive dysfunction. It's easy to administer. It's not threatening to the patient. It takes very little time. 
It's easy to document graphically in clinical records. You just put the clock in there. And it can be used to document deterioration over time in dementia patients. And uh, normal clock drying ability, um, they said reasonably excludes cognitive impairment. So abnormal clock drying can uh, reasonably include cognitive impairments. Um, uh, here is one study that um, looked at a new way of scoring the clock drawing. That's always a problem, how to score it. We started out with, with the clicket scoring system uh, of uh, 36 points and uh, got it down to uh, 13 points that we could do with great uh, reliability, inner, inner um, rate of reliability in scoring the clocks. Um, and they looked at 119 active drivers, 60 and older, uh, who were referred um, at an outpatient driving clinic, driving evaluation clinic. And uh, they used the clock drawing and uh, the uh, systems or system drive uh, simulator test. And they found that the clock drawing had a high level of accuracy in predicting driving situation outcomes. And uh, as the clock drawing store score decreased, the number of simulated driving errors increased. So they conclude the clock drawing can help establish problems with executive functions and indeed the need for formal driving evaluation. And Shulman uh, asked the question, is uh, clock drawing an ideal cognitive screen testing? And uh, found in a Medline and Psycho uh, Info Lit Search uh, in all languages from 1983 to 1998. Uh, so a very good search of the literature. Um, he said, among published studies, a mean sensitivity, 85%, and specificity, 85% of clock drying are impressive. And uh, generally, a good correlation between clock drying and other cognitive tests, and uh, high rates of uh, inner rate of reliability and positive predictive values are recorded by some studies. Uh, maybe not all because of that um, uh, scoring problem. If the scoring is uh, not really um, assessed thoroughly, that you have integrated reliability on scoring. And despite significant variabilities in the clock, uh, in the scoring systems, all reported similar psychometric properties. So a little give and take there. And um, they said that it also shows a sensitivity to cognitive change with good predictive validity. Um, so clock trying really assess all five of the cognitive uh, domains that we have discussed uh, throughout uh, this, this uh, webinar. Um, and uh, it too, the CLQT clock drawing, um, is a sensitive screen for neurological dysfunction. And the way we do it, it's a pre-drawn clock, and that's because we could not get integrated reliability and what's a, a good drawn circle. And also, uh, as I'll show you, uh, the drawn clock can be so um, lopsided or tiny that you can't even get the numbers in. But anyway, uh, we asked them to set the clock to 10 minutes after 11. So here you go. The instructions are there, so there's not a lot of memory component. Um, and those are, uh, instructions are spoken as well as read. And here's why we don't draw the circle. Here are two examples of circles that people, well, can't really agree on. And uh, you see the one on the left is so tiny. Um, it's actually larger on the screen, but it was so tiny on paper, it couldn't fit the numbers in anyway. Um, so here's a, 
uh, patient I saw with clock drawing uh, to uh, command and uh, without the this is before the uh, CLQT was published and we we're just doing it to command to draw a clock and he drew I think that was probably going to be a cuckoo clock yeah, because we, or a grandfather clock, maybe. Yeah, a grandfather clock because the pendulum. Um, and the second attempt to copy, he does uh, pretty well, except he's got to put that pendulum again. And that's a, a case of perseveration. And um, why do we do 10 minutes after 11? Well, uh, it puts the placement of the hands in the superior quadrants on both sides of space, picking up that left neglect thing, um, and uh, uh, field cuts. Um, and the 10 uh, must be represented by the number 2 to do 10 minutes after. But the number 10 on the clock is adjacent to the number 11. So if you have uh, the examinees have stimulus bound tendencies, they're pulled to that number 10 after uh, sitting right beside the 11 and they point uh, their second hand to the 10 and here's an example of someone doing just that and uh, not pointing uh, with a long hand to 2 for 10 minutes after. Okay, uh, we may have a little time to just go through some various clocks just to get a sense of them, I'll move quickly. Uh, a lot of these are in the uh, manual, but some aren't. Okay, uh, here's an Alzheimer's disease clock uh, drawn by somebody with Alzheimer's disease who wrote the time instead of using the clock hands. Uh, so relying on his better language skills. Um, and here's uh, someone with AD who just keeps going with his numbers. And uh, this is a right CVA, um, uh, poor planning uh, on that left side. Um, here's somebody with a left CVA and aphasia who had difficulty num with uh, drawing the numbers but went all the way around the clock properly. If we look at the six and the three and the nine, the spacing is pretty good. Um, and Here's uh, another case of an uh, 85-year-old or 84-year-old with Alzheimer's disease. And uh, you can see pull the, to the 10 and the 11 even though they're uh, not sitting next to each other. So pulled by just the number 10, uh, the, the thinking about the number 10. Um, severe perseveration, just drawing circles inside circles and that person had just done circles instead of uh, crosses on the um, symbol cancellation so they were perseverating on circles. And here's one that was sent to me um, by a former student uh, four weeks post a left middle cerebral artery and the perseveration of the name Matt, Ben. And this person was not called Ben um, and so we think it was some uh, thought about Big Ben or even Little Ben, the alarm clock. Um, here's a right frontal hemorrhage, uh, two weeks post, and a perseveration of hands. Um, here's a severe perseveration uh, in what we call carryover, and this person uses both words and numbers. Ten pass, five passed, and pass becomes paced, and 15 has multiple E's in it, and so forth. So really picked up the perseveration, and even then copy, draw, draw a, not clock, but a check, and paw cheek, an interesting clock. And um, this 84-year-old male was sent to me as somebody who had a small left CVA and only mild aphasia. And I thought, this is not just mild aphasia. This person is also uh, experiencing dementia. And indeed, uh, his CLQT was uh, indicative of that. Um, and you can use the clicker to uh, 
to assess changes. Um, this is sent to me by another of my former students, uh, Ellen McCracken, who's in the field now. And um, she assessed someone with a clock um, uh, just shortly after uh, post onset. And uh, you can see how disordered this is on 9 5 11. And then on 9 13 11, uh, uh, virtually a full recovery and this person went on to uh, spend very little time in rehab and go home. Okay, well thank you for your participation in this Pearson webinar. Um, I hope that uh, you've uh, learned something uh, and if you knew some of this or all of it already, I hope it served as a good review. Thank you.